there's so much information readily available today that it can be difficult to know where to focus your attention as a practicing guitarist. Analysis paralysis kicks in and it leads to stagnation, loss of motivation and a feeling of being overwhelmed. In today's jazz practice vlog, I want to share with you my thoughts on this topic and how you can prevent analysis paralysis from either limiting your practice or affecting your fluency when improvising. So what is analysis paralysis? Well, for me, a basic sort of explanation of it would be when you're trying to do something, trying to make a decision or move forward with something, you're confronted with so many different possibilities that you, you don't take any action. If you're indecisive like me, this is a problem. And how does this manifest itself on a stage or in the practice room? Well, more choice equals more possibilities and more freedom of ideas. Now, new possibilities can be really exciting, but what can happen is we sometimes move on to something else before we're ready, and we end up with lots of disparate ideas, and it all doesn't come together as a whole to help you become a better musician. AP, as I'm going to call it now, kills productive practice for me. It takes away any clarity you might have to a practice plan, and also when improvising, it disrupts the flow. And in relation to practice, there's so much to practice that sometimes you might have a practice session where you've spent the time doing it, but you feel like you haven't practiced anything at all. It's a bit like that moment when you're at a restaurant and you're casting your eye over a menu. I mean, are you the sort of person that instantly makes up your mind, I'm, I'm going, for the, going for the steak? Or are you the sort of person like myself who would probably have two or three options that I'm kind of weighing up and I would wait till the last second for the waiter or the waitress ask me for, for my choice. This is why surf and turf is a wonderful thing on a menu for indecisive people. So sometimes I feel like with practice, there's so much we can practice that it can be hard to make a decision on what to focus on in that particular moment. When it comes to improvising, there's so many things you can call upon. Like you could be thinking in terms of, oh, time to try that lick, or I could use Lydian Dominant here. Or maybe the altered scale, who knows? But you know, what, what happens in real time in it when you're trying to play over a jazz standard, those chords keep hitting you like waves. And if you miss one, it's hard to play catch up and those waves keep hitting you, you keep knock, getting knocked back down by it and if you haven't, you know, gone with something, then you, you, you're gonna, the chords are gonna pass you by. So separately, I'm gonna address the problem of AP in relation to improv and also practice. Let's take a look at improvising first. In a gig situation, I always feel like I improvise at my best when I'm not really thinking about anything like scales, arpeggios, lines I've learned, anything like that arpeggio substitutions, none of that stuff comes into my head. If I do get into that sort of mindset of thinking about scales and arpeggios and all that sort of stuff, then it can be hard to make a decision on what to use, or, or you end up just playing scales and arpeggios and they sound like scales and arpeggios. And if I, if I slip into that mindset, A, it really annoys myself, but it just sounds like someone practicing and it lacks direction and often feel. So for me, when I'm improvising and we're playing at my best, that thought isn't going through my head. There are things I'll be thinking of a melody or trying to tell a story over those chords. But what I'm really doing is tapping into harmonic material, which I have practiced so much, I've pushed it into my unconscious. Things I can really hear and call upon. Things which have become just, you know, they're there. I can hear them, I can go for those sounds, and I can create new melodies and melodic lines with those things. I've said it many times before, but you have to practice things until you don't have to think about them for them to be useful in a sort of real time situation when you're improvising. And I don't think jazz improvisation really fits the true meaning of the word. Let's take this definition that I've uh, found in the dictionary. Something that is improvised, in particular a piece of music, drama, etc., created spontaneously or without preparation. My argument against this is my next solo will be the culmination of my last 24 years of playing guitar. The standards I've listened to, the standards I've learned, the, the players I've learned from, the licks, the scales, the arpeggios, the ear training, all that stuff will contribute to what solo I produce at that moment in time. A jazz solo is something that takes years of preparation, if we're honest. And for me, the solution to this problem, instead of thinking about all those possibilities and, let's say, getting overwhelmed by the possibilities of potential scales, potential arpeggios, and things like that, what you really want to do is focus on telling a story. Each standard has its own story to tell. You wouldn't play over in a sentimental mood in the same way that you're going to play over John Coltrane's Mr. PC, for instance. I can't remember where I heard it, but I have heard of, you know, improvising in jazz in regards to it's it's like telling a tale over a tale. I'm trying to engage my thoughts and more like phrasing and creating melodic lines which tell a story over those chord changes. Rather than getting bogged down by what specific notes to play, the notes that I play will come from the different harmonic possibilities that I've practiced and that will help me create phrases to tell that story. 
and I trust my ear rather than my brain in this real-time moment. Each phrase opens the door to the next phrase as the story unfolds that you're trying to tell. You might be thinking this sounds super, super cheesy, and I can, I can see why you might think that, but think of the best solos. They often have a beginning, middle, and an end. They often have momentum, points of t where they really build up to something. Solo, I know for those great solos are really well punctuated with good phrasing and good amounts of space and bits where there's less space and all the different variety that you get in a well-told story. All these things blend together to form a coherent story. If you're not familiar with things like call and response and basic use of things like repetition with phrases, then that's where I would start. Also, and a very simple way to tell the story of a standard is to embellish the melody. Listen to the greats and how they structured their solos too. How many start with sparse phrasing, you know, lots of gaps and then build up to less space. And returning back to AP in relation to your improvising. So to avoid getting stuck into that kind of analytical side of the brain where you're, you're thinking about all those different things you've practiced and how you're going to apply them, uh, focus instead on phrasing and telling a story and those phrases building on each other. If you can't do that yet, then I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but it might be that you've not practiced those things enough yet or that you haven't paired it with sufficient ear training. But no matter how far you're into your jazz guitar journey, when it comes to practicing improvising, you know, don't, don't let things hold you back. You know, work with what you have now to say something, to tell your story at whatever stage you're at, whatever, you know, fretboard knowledge, harmonic knowledge you have, you'll be able to do something and enjoy it and take risks and surprise yourself. Now let's refocus our attention back to practice and AP. Compared to improvising at a gig or a jam session, the practice room is obviously a less pressured situation. So it's maybe not as serious a problem, but actually, you know, if AP really does kind of take hold in a practice session, it can just ruin the sort of usefulness of that time that you, you could have had. Either we're indecisive or we put off making decisions and before we know it, time's up and that's your practice for the day gone and it feels like it's wasted and it's, it's such a shame when it happens. What, so I'm interested, what's your decision making like currently in the practice room? Do you have a clear plan? Or sometimes do you kind of, you know, waste time in sessions and think, oh, should I do that now? Should I do this now? You know, just dead time that you could be practicing. I've got three things that I think can help and I'll explore each one in detail. Here's three things I want to talk about in relation to this. I'll put these on the screen. One, be super specific with what you're working with. Two, impose limits on yourself. Three, a teacher or mentor can really help here. Someone to keep you on track or to give you clarity on how to move forward. So let's talk about specifics first. Jazz standards are great for this. There's so many you could be working on. Uh, you could easily you know, flip between different ones within a practice session or over the course of a week. Or you could be more specific and be like, right, I'm going to work on one jazz standard a month, one jazz standard a week, say, whatever works for you. It can then get more specific, like, right, today I'm going to work on the first eight bars of all the things you are, or I'm going to work on the B section of Caravan, rather than a less focused practice session where you might look at the whole thing or multiple jazz standards. Because if you practice doing something over the first eight bars of all the things you are, you can be sure they're going to help you play other songs in the long run too. This year, I've been trialing doing one a week. And some weeks are better than others, but I am finding it quite good and it's working for me right now. I'll have to yeah, um, share some thoughts on that when I get to the end of the year and, and see how it's gone overall. And if you're unsure which ones to focus your attention on, check out my uh, top 10 jazz standards for beginners video. And in regards to other elements of practice beyond standards, for me, it comes down to awareness. For instance, if you're working on scales, how are you working on them? Is it from a technical point of view, ear training, rhythmic point of view? Is it trying to apply over chords, trying to create phrases with it? It can't just it can't just be scale practice. It needs to be more specific than that. If you're working with a lick, there's you know it starts off maybe learning the lick, learning it in different positions, trying to understand it harmonically, trying to see what other chords it work over, trying it against chords, maybe then trying it over a backing track, maybe then trying it in different keys. To help focus my own practice, I divide it up into chunks of 15, 20 minute chunks uh, with specific sections for, for each thing. That That is a working kind of document, my practice plan, but I try to stick to that. And if I do stick to it, my practice is usually um, has a good sense of purpose. Occasionally I find I have a day uh, like where some of the things that I've been describing happen and I'm really unfocused and I feel like I've got nothing achieved and I'm always really annoyed with myself when that happens. It's usually if I'm tired too, you know, that doesn't help point was to impose limits on yourself. This can work wonders. Here's some limits I like to work with. Learning a new jazz standard, right? Well, you could impose a limit of maybe trying to sell over those changes just with the third, seventh, and ninth intervals. Uh, you could be like, right, okay, I'm not really getting many 16th notes into my playing, so I'm gonna solo just with 16th notes, or 
uh, I'm going to try starting all my phrases on the and of one. A great limit to imposing yourself is to play more slowly, that way you can absorb the sound of everything more. As I said earlier, you could limit how much of a song you're working on, it could be just one, you know, section of a song rather than all of it, or it could just be one specific chord change you're having difficulty with. Because it's not that efficient to play over the whole thing if it's just pockets of it which are causing you problems. If you're working over, say, two five ones, you could be like, right, I'm only going to use triads, or I'm only going to use pentatonics to try and solo with. You could limit yourself to one or two strings, uh, and I find all these things kind of imposing limitations on yourself they can a help you get to know something really well but also they can really force you to be creative which is which is a really great thing the third thing was you know getting the advice and support of someone else sometimes you just need help from someone that's been there and done it or a fresh perspective on on how you're engaging with the guitar and your practice one thing i never stop so one thing i never you know we never as guitar as jazz guitar players we can we never really stop learning and one thing i'm always interested in is learning about ideas on practice and improvising and I'm always a, a avid reader of books on those topics. You may wish to look for a local teacher that you can work with one-to-one -one, or there might be a friend you've got who's more experienced at, at playing than you that can help you navigate practice a bit more and I think it's just all about gaining clarity on what you should be working on. Um, there's always that old problem is we don't know what we don't know and it's helpful to have someone that's been through all of this to sort of give us a roadmap of what to practice and where not where to focus our time and where to avoid wasting time. What should you be working on? Naturally, we'll have gaps in our learning. Sometimes we think we know something when actually we've got a very superficial understanding of it. Um, yeah, also, this sort of accountability of working with someone else can be really useful. Uh, so that's something to think about, I think, there. Um, there's also obviously forums as well, which are great places uh, for getting uh, advice and support in terms of, you know, if you're having difficulty with something or to see what other people say on the topic. One thing I was trying to do with my private students is create a little practice plan and put a map in place of where things are going and try to review that periodically. Uh, if, if lessons is something you're interested in, that there's a section on my website about that. Uh, I do lessons via Zoom and Skype. But obviously I said, you know, there might be teachers local to you and things like that or friends you've got that are more experienced than you at playing that, that can help you with this type of thing. I hope you found this vlog interesting. It's something I've been thinking about for a while. I've been thinking about making a video on this topic. And I think it's something which affects people in all walks of life. Um, something that uh, if you're indecisive like me, it can it can make things difficult on, on how to move forward and, and make sure that you use your time well. Uh, and I'll put up two videos related to topics we talked about today. My video on portioning the changes a practice method I like to use. And also uh, my practice vlog just goes through my own um, practice session and explains my thinking behind it. But anyway, leave me any questions, any thoughts on this topic below and I'll see you next time.